It was a beautiful day when we started away With a smile of content on our faces With plenty to eat there was nothing good beat A jolly good day of the races Dan Lino was born into a performing family on the 20th of December, 1860, at Eve Court near St Pancras, London. In 1884, he married Lydia Reynolds, who had joined the family act as a vocalist when just 15. By the time they married, she'd also given birth to their first daughter, Georgina Louisa. But this fact was deliberately obscured by Dan throughout his life because of the scandal it would have caused. 1885 saw Dan's first London solo engagement at the Forester's Music Hall Mile End. It was from this point that Dan began to establish the pattern of employment that was to last for the rest of his career. March to December he would do music hall bookings, then pantomime from Christmas until March, two weeks holiday in August, plus an occasional burlesque or musical comedy role. He might be engaged to perform at two or even three theatres in a single night and for up to six nights a week. His routine would last no more than five to ten minutes at each venue. Dan Lino effectively defined what we now recognise as stand-up comedy. Dan's career started as a clog dancer, but this was reduced to no more than a trademark introduction of his comic songs. In keeping with most music hall material of the time, his early songs were tough and violent like Queen of My Heart, or sentimental like Pity the Poor Italian. But during the 1880s and 90s, these became just a prelude to the comic character monologues for which Dan Lino is best remembered, such as The Shop Walker or Railway Worker. Dan's characters were carefully observed, acutely presented examples of how daily life confounds and disappoints ordinary people. Not in a depressing or doer way, but with a spirit of resilience and wry humour that has distinct resonances with artists such as Stan Laurel, Rob Wilton, Joyce Grenfell, Ronnie Barker, Catherine Tate and Paul Whitehouse. All perform recognisable, ordinary characters struggling comically against the pitfalls of everyday life. Uh, I suppose uh, you don't care for any other colour, only white... Another feature of Lino's characters was their wordplay, a style that presages artists such as George Roby, Ronnie Barker, Les Dawson, Eddie Izzard, Bill Bailey and Russell Brand. His characters helped people to laugh at their own predicaments, while his verbal confusions and physical energy reflected the chaos of ordinary lives. One need only look at the mighty Bush and Bill Bailey to see how the same muddled perspectives inform today's clowns. Between 1894 and 1901, Dan Lino became involved in music hall management. It was a natural step for an acknowledged star such as Dan to explore the possibilities of management. He joined forces with his pals Herbert Campbell and Johnny Danvers and bought a series of music halls in Clapham, Wallam Green and Camberwell. But the competition they represented was seen as a threat to the existing owners who collaborated to drive them out of business by imposing restrictions on artists from performing at the new syndicate's halls. Dan was forced back into a situation where he could only work for the mainstream managements, the very people who had destroyed his attempt to join their ranks. Just like Joey Grimaldi a century earlier, Dan Lino wished to achieve the status and respectability afforded to legitimate artists. Dan's equivalent in the dramatic arts was Sir Henry Irving, who was the finest legitimate actor-manager of the age and the first ever actor to be honoured with a knighthood in 1895. Irving believed that there was an intrinsic distinction between the high and low arts, with the music hall merely being an extension of the tavern trade. I've just come back from where I've been, as you may well suppose. No doubt to feel astonished or to see me in these clothes. Dan Lino was the equivalent to Irving in both status and popularity and was the first musical artist to receive a royal command in 1901 but was never allowed the respectability or legitimacy in the art that he craved. Dan was even excluded from participating in various charitable projects such as the Drury Lane Fund because he was from the illegitimate theatre. But in spite of this, 
He championed philanthropy within the profession, always keen to support those less well off than himself. He became president of the Music Hall Benevolent Fund, the Music Hall Railway Rates Association, and an early member of the Grand Order of Water Rats. He regularly organised and participated in charity sporting events. This charitable work earned Dan the admiration of his fellow artists and provided the status and respect due to the leader of those within his profession. Dan's ubiquitous presence in the public eye was maintained by an astute use of merchandise and innovative technology. Printed picture postcards divided into a message and address section were a new way of sending messages around the country. Dan was one of the first to exploit the opportunity and produce dozens of self-promotional images to be sold at shows and augment both his income and fame. His image was reproduced on bookmarks, mugs and even inkwells. In 1899, his performance was transmitted by electrophone to Queen Victoria in Windsor Castle from St James's Hall. From 1901, he made regular gramophone recordings and even had three short films made, none of which survived. Although such recorded formats cannot do justice to an act defined by movement and audience response, Dan embraced everything that might increase his fame and popularity. In 1899, a spoof autobiography was produced entitled Dan Lino, His Book, which quickly became a bestseller and Dan Lino's comic journal was launched in 1898. It was a cheap, cheerful publication aimed at the typical music hall audience member. Dan contributed ideas and material for the two years that it ran. Then in 1902, what was then a London evening newspaper, The Sun, invited him and Herbert Campbell to be the guest editors for April Fool's Day. Amidst the fame and tribulations of his career, Dan's personal life is not well documented. Having married Lydia Reynolds in 1884, he pursued an apparently model life of propriety and responsibility at home. In addition to his public philanthropy, Dan's home life was always portrayed as comfortable, responsible and stable. He's often pictured in front of his detached residence in Clapham, surrounded by his wife and children. The house had three acres of land attached, plus stables and upwards of six servants. Dan was materially successful and socially accepted. He was first taken mentally ill in 1902, but recuperated sufficiently to perform occasionally during the next two years. However, his behaviour became increasingly erratic, with a loss of hearing and a somewhat cantankerous attitude. He increasingly turned to alcohol, and his moods would swing rapidly from hysterical to subdued. In 1904, aged 43, he died in the arms of his wife. The cause of death was certified as general paralysis of the insane, which was often used in those days as a euphemism for syphilis. Whether or not this is true, and whether it was inherited or contracted from illicit liaisons, we shall probably never know. But his last years were spent in confusion and frustration, unable to hear or think articulately. A sad end for an artist of consummate skill. Many thousands of people lined the streets three deep for over three miles to pay their last respects at the funeral procession of Dan Lee. Day when we started away with a smile of content on our faces, with plenty to eat, there was nothing but beat, a jolly good day of the races.